Janice, thank you for that. Um, well, I'm pleased to welcome you all. Um, some new faces and some familiar faces to uh, Parliament buildings today. And, uh, and apologies in advance, I do have to leave to chair the, the Health Committee, but I do think that this is a particularly important topic that's been addressed today, and I can see the direct link uh, with the piece of work that the Committee um, for Health, Social Services and Public Safety has done in relation to not only learning disabilities, but health inequalities and how we look at models that can actually effectively target those health inequalities uh, and what is, in essence, the right fit that we need as a society. Uh, the themes, as I said, are promoting health and addressing health inequalities for people with intellectual disabilities and also looking specifically today at autism spectrum disorder, including, and I think is critically important, the early intervention uh, models that we need and the parent training that we need around these issues. And as a committee, and I, I am sure most people in this room would be aware that you know, there, there can be various classifications of, of intellectual or learning disabilities. It, it, it can be classified as, as mild, moderate, or severe. And there's quite often a, an additional diagnosis um, for, for an individual, for example, autism, um, Down syndrome, and, and sometimes challenging behaviours that come with that. So in recent years, in terms of a policy shift, the key policy driver for people with learning disability in the north of Ireland was a Bamford review um, and the publication of the Equal Lives report back in 2006. And I suppose um, you know, we, we can debate, and, and we often do, about the recommendations of Bamford, but the report clearly highlighted the inequalities that exist and that are faced by um, people on a daily basis that have a learning disability. So for that reason, and, and I suppose um, one of, of the planks of the Transforming Your Care agenda uh, was looking at issues like, and I don't even like the use of the word, but issues like resettlement into communities. Um, and looking specifically at, at, at the whole learning disabilities um, field. So we undertook a, a piece of work, a review, in and around health inequalities. And you know, we, we, we could probably state that the general health of the north of Ireland um, is improving. The, the gap between those who have and those who haven't is certainly not improving. Um, and I know in the piece of work that we did in committee, uh, it was very even clearly identified in terms of health inequalities right down to constituency. And those constituencies that were most stark in relation to the haves and have not and the impact on your life was West Belfast, North Belfast, and my own constituency of FOIL. So there's a need um, when we're deciding policy um, to ensure that resources are targeted to where those health inequalities exist. Our committee in July um, published a report, and, 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 and maybe some of you have reflected on or not, but specifically into learning disability, and, and particularly in terms of that service model for learning disability in terms of, again, transforming your care and the implementation plan, and whether it really had the potential to reduce health inequalities for, for this group in our communities and society. And whilst there was no exact figures on the numbers living with a learning disability, which I think is an issue in itself, um, there was up to 2% of the population that may have been affected, and there was other data that suggested that around 26,500 people have a learning disability, and half of those fallen into the not to 10 age group. So clearly a significant section of our, our communities and societies. And people, as I said, with a learning disability, um, I know this, I'm also a director of a learning disability charity uh, at home. Th there's often multiple health uh, problems associated with that and often difficulties about communication um, leading to challenges and identifying health issues. Uh, and and one, of, one of the things that we discovered when we were undertaking the inquiry was the issue around, for example, annual GP uh, checkups and the number of the individuals, organisations, sectors that we spoke to weren't even aware that there was, there was a requirement there for GPs to, to deliver on that. The inquiry, the confidential inquiry into premature deaths of people with a learning disability, which was published in 2013, 
it actually examined the, the unexpected deaths of 247 people with learning disability, which was in southwest England at that time. And quite starkly, in my view, the investigation concluded that 37% of those deaths could have actually been prevented. So there's, there's, a, there's a key challenge um, for us in this room and in rooms beyond this. So I'm, I'm pleased um, to have the opportunity to welcome you and make those initial remarks. I know that we'll hear today from Dr. Taggart, I think, and Dr. Cousins, who will speak, just looking at the issues around the health inequalities and, and models uh, that could be adapted to, I suppose, target and eradicate some of the very real experiences that are felt on a very, very regular basis by you know, huge sections of our communities and society. So thank you very much, and apologies again, because I do have to fly off. Um, but certainly from, from the committee's perspective, our door is open to continuing the learning that we have picked up on since we completed the review. So I hope, really, it's a productive afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lawrence Taggart. I'm a reader at the University of Ulster, and my presentation this afternoon is around people with intellectual disability, promoting health, addressing inequality. So this, this, this afternoon's talk, there's four areas that I'd like to fo focus on. The first around is what are the problems that people with intellectual disabilities currently face in relation to what the evidence tells us? The second are what are the health barriers and the determinants of these health inequalities. Then looking at something more positive, I want to know how can we overcome these health inequalities and promote health, and to try and end with the concluding message that you can take home. Maeve has already pointed to, to the recent uh, Confidential Inquiry Report, published in March 2013, where she said that on average, people with intellectual disabilities will die 20 years younger than people without intellectual disabilities, which is a startling find, finding in the year 2014. There are three leading causes of death, respiratory disease, coronary heart disease, and specific cancers. And the specific cancers are around uh, stomach and gallbladder cancers and os uh, esophagus cancer. And again, these types of cancers are generally related to health and health-related lifestyle behaviors. But in addition to these startling findings, there are a range of other secondary or chronic health conditions that this population <coughs> suffer from and experience compared to more than the general population. So for example, a large percentage of people with intellectual disabilities will have hearing, visual and dental problems. Again, the recent research has shown that people with intellectual disabilities are possibly three to four times more likely to have type two diabetes and we know type 2 diabetes is generally caused by lifestyles, so again, can be prevented. Again, a large number of people with intellectual disabilities will suffer from physical disabilities and the associated problems that we find with that. Again, there's about 20% of people with intellectual disability will experience epilepsy, and those with more severe and profound learning disabilities will suffer from gastroesophageal reflux disorder, Higher rate of people with physical disabilities will suffer from injuries and accidents and falls. And there's recent work by Professor Mary McLaren looking at over 800 adults with intellectual disabilities over the age of 40, and she followed them over two time points, and she found that 70%, sorry, 37% of that older population suffered from osteoporosis, which is quite a startling finding. Again, we know about 30 to 40% of people with learning disabilities have and will suffer and experience mental health problems. And again, we know there's a strong link between Down syndrome and, and early, early onset dementia. So what are some of the reasons and the barriers or the determinants of these health? And the work of Eric Emerson and Chris Hatton, they have grouped them into four categories. The first is around biological and genetic factors. So we know people like, for example, as I was saying with Down syndrome, are more likely to experience dementia. Again, there are certain genetic disorders, like leash neon syndrome or prader williams syndrome, will have certain specific, maybe specific mental health problems or behaviours associated with them. Again, we know ageing is a risk factor, and there is some research starting to show 
that people with intellectual disabilities age, young, age quicker than, than, the, than their peers. And again, we also know, I, I put this in this category, medication, I wasn't sure which category to put it in, but we also start to know the effects of antipsychotic medication. Uh, again, if we look at abdominal obesity, uh, and again, that links to type 2 diabetes, and there's other, there's other side effects of medication. And remember, uh, a number of people with intellectual disabilities are prescribed antipsychotic medication, many times for their behaviour, and not for their therapeutic properties, say for an underlying mental health problem. And there's been a number of meta-analyses undertaken around antipsychotic medication, and it has shown that it's inconclusive, but it does appear to be the number one uh, intervention. And, and again, I suppose it's just going back to these biological genetic factors. Many of those we may not be able to address. Like we can't address the age, we can't address genetics. We, 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 know. And we can maybe look at medication and, and, and better medication. But the next group of determinants of health are risk factors. These are the ones that we can address and we can do something about. And these are the ones that will have an impact and improve health. So, for example, we already know that this population has a poor diet nutrition. We already know that only about 7 to 10 percent of children and adults with intellectual disability adhere to the World Health recommendations around moderate to vigorous activity. We have high levels of sedentary behaviour, sitting still, doing nothing. And again, as you know, this leads to high levels of obesity. And this, in addition to high rates of antipsychotic medication, will lead to abdominal obesity. And maybe that's one of the reasons our stronger link to type 2 diabetes and other conditions that we find. Young people with more, moderate, more mild intellectual disabilities are more likely to smoke or use alcohol, again, to fit in with their non-disabled peers. And again, the high risk of mental health. And then the issues around sexual health promotion. Again, the, the difficulties that we have uh, in, in promoting that. These are, these are determinants of health. These are risk factors that we can address that will change health. The second, the, sorry, the third group of risk factors is around the socio-economic, <coughs> cultural and environment. These are around attitudes. And again, we know that many people in our society hold negative attitudes to people with disability. And these negative attitudes lead to discriminatory practices. And again, we also know that people with intellectual disabilities, many of them, live in poor socioeconomic status backgrounds. And we know that there's a link between poor socioeconomic status background, deprivation income, and poor physical and mental health. And again, there's a link with these attitudes and these discriminatory practices in relation to social exclusion. And there's a certain number of small groups or subpopulations within this field that we also need to think about. As I was saying, Northern Ireland, in the lands of the UK and the Republic of Ireland, has a higher rate of people with intellectual disability living with their family carers. And many of those family carers are getting older, 60, 70, 80, 90 years of age, but also the person with intellectual disability is getting older as well, but they're living together. And again, we need to think about how do we support these older family carers as well. Again, Maeve's already pointed to a higher rate of young people with intellectual disabilities living longer but they will live in the adulthood. And we need to look at how do we support children and adults with complex physical health needs and other additional needs and the cost that this will impose upon family carers. And again, Maeve did point to how many people in Northern Ireland do have an intellectual disability and the figures do change. But we do think about half of this population and we think it's about maybe 32,000 people, only about half are knowing the intellectual disability services. There's another half of people with intellectual disabilities who do not use learning disability services. And these are at the at-risk group because they're trying to live in the community, either with family or by themselves, and they're trying to, or they may not be, using mainstream services. But they, are, would be from a, they would have little income and they would not be using mainstream services. And they are at a high-risk group. And ID services will, are more likely to see them when there's a crisis occur, whether that would be mental health or forensic. And again, looking outside of Northern Ireland, the majority of people with intellectual disability do live in low-income low countries, and most of the research does not go to there. Most of the research in this population are done in westernised countries, and again, that's something we need to think about. But the fourth determinant of health is around 
Health Services. And the Confidential Inquiry Report highlights this. Many people with intellectual disabilities do have communication issues. They do rely upon family and paid staff, many who may not have the experience of the knowledge of certain signs and symptoms of health conditions. There is difficulties around the lack of coordination from primary and acute hospitals and ID services. There's physical access for people with physical disabilities. There's a lack of training for a primary and healthcare staff. And again, the Discrimination Act of 2005 and 2010 have highlighted that mainstream services should, where possible, make reasonable adjustments. But where are these reasonable adjustments being made? There is good some practice been undertaken in Northern Ireland, but as you'll see shortly, there is still a lot of reasonable adjustments to be made. There's issues around where the people with intellectual disability, where do their family cares, where do their paid staff, but also where do primary and acute hospital and, and community services have user-friendly literature to, to highlight signs and symptoms and what to do. And again, we need to be promoting early health screening. And again, we need to be looking at the role of health promotion. Because at the minute, we're very much at a crisis. We're very much at a firefighting service where we wait till the problem occurs and then we intervene. And we're very good at that. But we need to be identifying, if I've identified there's all these mental health problems, type 2 diabetes, obesity issues, obesity issues we need to be looking at how do we identify those, those people who are at high risk and intervene early. So just to try and summarise both the international and the national reports that have been highlighted, the US Surgeon's General Report said that we're falling off a cliff. The Disability Rights Commission said that there's inequality. MENCAP Report 2004-2007 talked about indifference. The MICRO Report talked about discrimination. The Six Lives Report talked about substandard care. And the Confidential Inquiry, just recently published less than a year ago, talked about unacceptable situation. All these reports repeat the same message that community and, and hospital health care services consistently fail to work together to make reasonable adjustments to meet the health needs of this population effectively. And it's this that we need to think about. We need to highlight the determinants of this population and we need to try and address them. So the second part of my talk is, is moving forward, is looking towards changing the health care that we provide. And there are five challenges the first is, is around educating and empowering both staff and family carers, but more importantly, the person with intellectual disability. And this is the foundation. Empowerment is the foundation uh, of the Ottawa Charter around health promotion in 1986. We need to translate research evidence into user-friendly information. And we need to ensure that this user-friendly information is in all practices, in all health centres, in all outpointment all appointment clinics, in hospital settings, but also within schools and community settings for people with intellectual disability. And we also need to know that paid staff and family carers and also professional staff have access to this information so that they can educate the person with intellectual disabilities, they can empower the person with intellectual disabilities to make a more informed choice. The, the work of Professor Sheila Hollands over in the Royal College of Psychiatrists. She has developed a series of booklets called Beyond Words, and, and you can, I've just given some examples on the board. But more recently, with three examples within Northern Ireland, the work of Gillian Scott, a health facilitator in Northern Ireland, she has developed a, a, a booklet, a user-friendly booklet, on around managing type 2 diabetes for this population. M myself at the um, and a team of us at the University of Ulster and a local charity in Balamone called Compass, we have developed two booklets. The first is around How Are You Today? And it's a booklet for young people with intellectual disabilities to explore mental health. What are the signs and symptoms of mental health and how to seek help? And again, with this charitable organisation, Compass, we've also looked at how do women with intellectual disabilities experience a mammograph. And working with nine women with learning disabilities, we developed a user-friendly booklet called My Boobs and Me. These are all accessible and free to use. And a great website is called 
Easy Health, www.easyhealth.org. And this is a website where people, anybody, can access this website and download a range of accessible information for this population <coughs> or for carers. And the majority of the information is free to, is, is free to download. And I would encourage staff to, to, to go onto this website, both within general hospitals and primary practice, on a whole range of health topics. And again, we need to think about how we go forward into the future. I have an iPhone, I have an iPad, I probably use less than 10% of its capabilities, but my six-year-old can set me up with email and can do all sorts of stuff. We need to think how can we use technology and how we can help um, people with intellectual disability to use it. At the minute, there are over 5,000 health, health apps, but again, we don't know how they can be adapted for people with learning disabilities. And again, we're looking at our nurse education across Northern Ireland, both within the University of Ulster uh, and, and also within Queen's University. And we are getting people with learning disabilities into the curriculum. So in, in both our general programmes, in our mental health programmes and in our learning disability nursing programmes, where we have people with learning disabilities coming in and teaching nurses how to communicate and work with people with intellectual disabilities. So in the years ahead, they will have experience so again, we should not have these scandals reports that we're currently seeing over the last few years. And uh, we also have to promote a new book that's just been published this year, £29.99, published by myself and Wendy. And, and this is a book around where we've taken research and we have translated it into, uh, into practice. So again, we've taken all the jargon out of research and we've made it to be a very user-friendly book. It's written from a, a, by a team of international experts across the world around a range of those, those uh, diseases that we've talked about, primary and secondary diseases, and there's a lot of links to where to get information. So £29.99. <laughs> um, so again, the second challenge is around, the, uh, the, the continuous is around reliance on family and paid carers as advocates or champions or ambassadors of health. And again, it's trying to use evidence-based interventions there's one very, very good intervention at the minute. It's a, it's a program called Health Matters, where it trains staff for two days and then around diet and exercise. And then they go out and they work with adults with intellectual disabilities for 14 weeks. And that is very, very good success. And we currently have a PhD student, Lisa O'Leary, who has just completed her PhD in this area. It, it takes the trans-theoretical model of behaviour change and it applies to practice, and we look at pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, maintenance, and relapse. And she's just currently, currently this week, hopefully, submitting her thesis, and hopefully we'll have the results of that to share with you next year. So again, Maeve has already talked about, what about this unrecognised physical and mental health needs? In Northern Ireland, we have a very, very good system where we have the DES, the Direct Enhanced Services, where we provide health checks. And a health check is where a GP agrees to undertake an annual health check for a person with learning disability, and they do get paid for it. And there's been a number of refuse looking at health checks, and they said that they can detect a number of unmet, unrecognized, and potentially treatable health conditions, including serious and life-threatening conditions such as cancer, heart disease, and dementia. And then when the health check is completed, a health action plan is identified. And how this is carried out, that we've appointed nine health facilitators across Northern Ireland. And these are intellectual disability nurses who work with the GP and the practice nurse to facilitate the person with intellectual disabilities to attend the GP. They've been going for a number of years, and in many of the instances, the, 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 intellectual, the health facilitator doesn't need to be involved now because the GPs and the practice nurses have become comfortable with this process. And actually the work of these health facilitators is evolving and evolving into the work of health promotion. And the work of Professor Roy McConkie has just done a report around the health facilitators. And what he found was that the uptake of health checks within Northern Ireland was the highest within the UK. Seven, uh, I think it's 87% of GPs have agreed to undertake these health checks. This is a good news story. And, that's a, that's a, uh, and that provides us with a, a rate of about 64% of adults with intellectual disability in Northern Ireland currently receiving 
a health check, which is very good. That compares to only 46% in England. So a good news story. So again, in England, about a third of the English trusts, they employ hospital liaison nurses. And that is an intellectual disability nurse who works within an acute hospital. And when a person with intellectual disability comes into the hospital, they facilitate or support that person's journey, right from the, maybe the accident of the mission or the, the hospital admission, right through that journey through the hospital to discharge. And they can help coordinate care, educate with clinical areas, provide support and advice for nurses and doctors, provide and promote effective communication, provide support to family carers, again, also provide accessible information. And the work that's been done in Scotland around acute liaison nurses is very, very effective. At the minute, we don't have any in Northern Ireland, but again, this would be a good news. This would be a way to go to ensure that people with intellectual disabilities have a smooth journey through hospital. And again, we need to think about accessing public health community services. That means what the public health agency provide across Northern Ireland to all populations. And there have been few public health promotion and interventions that have supported people with intellectual disability to access these groups within the community. And most of the evidence based for public health, based, sorry, for public health community services um, has not targeted this population. It's, done in the target, it's been targeted at the general population. And we, again, we need to think about how public health programmes, public health agency programmes, target those who don't use learning disability services, that half of the population. And then what reasonable adjustments can these community services, these public health agency services, make for this population? But then we need to, work about, we need to think about how do we, as an intellectual community then, intellectual disability community, adapt these current programmes for this population? And again, this would allow us a continuous access to health literacy. It would provide us with a range of activities, community presence and connectedness. It would also have low cost interventions. And again, it will help sustain health promoting behaviours. And I just want to give you an example. Uh, if you or I were to develop type 2 diabetes, NICE guidelines in 2003 said that it would be good practice for us to attend a structured education programme. The one that they currently promote across the UK is Desmond. It stands for Diabetes Education and Self-Management for Ongoing and Newly Diagnosed Diabetes. We, through mon money from the Diabetes UK, have, in partnership with Scotland and Wales and England, we have taken this programme that's been targeted for the general population and we have adapted it for adults with intellectual disability. And we've just recently, last month, trained six nurses, two in each country, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales and we're about to roll this out and in Northern Ireland it's going to be rolled out in Antrim. So we're very excited where we've taken a community intervention and we've adapted it for people with intellectual disabilities. So this is an exciting process as well and again a low cost intervention. Does the government already roll these out? Again we've got the use of Special Olympics and their own clubs but we also have a new PhD student called Teresa Green and she wants to develop and test an education programme for your local leisure centre or private gym instructors to support people with intellectual disability to access local community fitness centres and also to look at a, a system of peer bodies. This will be a multi-educational package and like if you or I were to attend the gym, we would just pair up with a person with learning disabilities to support them to attend the gym. That covers the big issue of transport, which is a big issue. And again, we're looking at this programme. Will it involve and will it develop better community connectedness within our local area? And remember, again, this is a very low cost intervention that we think will have a good benefits long term. Coming to the end, the greater, we, we need to have greater partnership and working between intellectual disability services, between primary health care and acute hospitals. Uh, and these relationships is paramount to achieve successful health that will ensure active, <coughs> ongoing participation from everyone and ensure long-term positive health, health benefits. Scheduling preliminary meetings with all partners provides an opportunity to address concerns and respond to questions related to programme implementation for our community partners. And, and just let me explain to you what's currently happening within Northern Ireland. We have three leading documents, Equal Lives 2005, 
Transforming Your Care 2011 and the Learning Disability Service Framework. They've identified health as a key area and how to address these inequalities, and they have set up the Regional, Regional Learning Disability Health Care and Improvement Steering Group. And within that, there are three groups that meet. The first is the Regional Health Facilitators, and again, looking at the implementation of these annual health checks, these annual health plans, and now we're actually looking at the development of health promotion plans as well, which is very, very good. The second is the Regional Health and Social Wellbeing Improvement Forum, and they're looking at how can, we, how can the intellectual disability partner with the public health agency, and how can we look at all these community programmes that are offered for the general population, and how can reasonable adjustments be made that people with intellectual disabilities can access these in their local community? A great step forward. And again, our third is the Regional Contact with General Hospital Forum, which looks at the GAIN guidelines. There are 20 GAIN guidelines for how people with intellectual disabilities access hospital and have a smooth and safe journey from admission to discharge through hospital. I think there's some great work going to be coming out of these three subgroups and the regional group. So really, I'm hoping I'm kept in the time. Nobody's jumped up and shouted at me, so I must be all right. Um, again, health, health promotion and health wellbeing is a massive area. And what we're trying to do is to try and go, go forward and uh, pro um, improve equality, and that's what these policies say. And I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon's talk, and thank you. <laughs>